So I did. I did it. I teased the idea of winning the lottery. But here's the thing: could it, it could be the lottery? It could be a large inheritance. Our friend Todd Halterman is here. I, even even professional athletes. But I mean, I just saw. I just heard somebody say about a quarterback for one of the SEC schools in the in, in college got a uh, uh, one of those new deals for eight million dollars. So think about that. If, if you're in college and you get an eight million dollar contract, what do you think the likelihood is of you having any of that money by the time you leave college? So Todd Halterman, you're the guru. You know, think about. I, I know I saw one of your uh, comrades out here in Southern California shared that if if you win the lottery, call him first. What do I do if I were to win? Besides, call well, you first. Yeah. Well, the first thing you do is you protect yourself from any outside influence or parties. Everybody in the world wants what you have, and when everybody finds out you win the lottery, you're going to have a lot of friends you never had before. So the first thing we do is we set up an asset protection trust to hold their prize winnings, to make them um, protected from outside lawsuits, litigation, creditors, etc. But what a lot of people don't understand is defense wins championships, Ron, and we have to protect the people who have a large sum of cash. And it's also protecting themselves from themselves. What do you mean by that? Protecting themselves from themselves. You could be walking down this road and you could be walking into a mall and a young little girl gets her finger slammed in a door un unnoticed by you, but you were walking through the door. You could have any type of incident at any time. You could be in a car accident, not mean to, but rear end somebody and you just won the lottery. And now that person's out of work for life and uh, your policy insurance only covers 100000 per person. So there's just many different risks that exist that people don't even understand the enormity of what they could lose by simply a small accident. Interesting. Okay. So we, the first thing is that asset protection trust. Now, does that help me with the, am I just going to pay the taxes? Is that it? It's nothing I can do about that part. Well, and in, in reality is the taxes are due if it depends on if the person that wins the lottery takes a lump sum or they take it out in structured payments. But uh, the way the lotteries work, if you're taking it lump sum, that generally cuts your prize in half and then you'll pay tax on the other half. Um, there is one way to not pay taxes at closing, and that's to set up a certain type of trust that can hold the prize and then send you out the payments that you're due to get the money over time. Um, but you then you don't take the immediate, you know, 49, 47, 49% haircut that, that a lot of people would take um, for taxes. So that, that, that alone right there would make a whole lot of sense. Now, does that only work? Is that a, a lottery issue or do I do, would I use something like that for, if I had a large, uh, inheritance or a large, you know, athletic contract or, or acting or whatever, you know, any kind of a large contract? We well, get a large contract, a large sum of money. It's, it's a three, there's three layers to go. First is asset protection. Second is tax mitigation. And then third is what do you want to do with the money? So how do you put the money to work in your life? And there's needs and wants. And most people go out and capture all their wants and they outspend their needs. Uh, which means they run out. But uh, the person that buys that big, beautiful house doesn't realize that later the property taxes and maintenance of those five air conditioning systems and property taxes and landscapers and housekeepers, et cetera, adds up over time, which is why many people run out of their lotto pr proceeds uh, and they end up bankrupt. And I think I saw somewhere, and I don't, you know, this might go back to when I was in financial advising, but you know, the, the vast majority of athletes, even with these massive contracts, they end up five or six years after their, their playing days are over that they're looking for jobs just to, to feed the family. Is that, is that still the case? It is. Um, unfortunately, you see a lot of pro athletes and people that came into money quickly um, not have that money uh, in 10 years after they've received it. And it's really just it goes fast 
people to understand the complexity of managing money. And if it comes fast, it can leave fast. Yeah, you start thinking that. It, and it's amazing how in our society we, we kind of put people on these pedestals. So if you have no money, you're an idiot. If you have a lot of money, you're, you're a genius. And it may be just the exact opposite. Yeah, and I've, I've worked with professional athletes who have made $10 million over five years, and they, they still had five when they were done. And I have some that have made $100 million, and today um, they are working at scraping $100,000 a year together to live on. Yeah, it's amazing how that, uh, how that happens. You wanna, so so let's, let's talk to the next step, Todd. What's the, what's the board of directors, that household board of directors? What do I need if I come into a large sum of money, inheritance, work, lotto, whatever? Well, I think a lot of families um, try to become their own head bottle washer, cook, and CEO. Um, most major companies or businesses that are highly successful have a legal officer, have a tax or finance officer. They have advisors around them that help them uh, have a better life and a better business. And uh, a lot of times small business owners or individual families alone uh, don't want to see the attorney to pay them, uh, think they can do their taxes on their own, try to do all their own investing. And the bottom line is, folks, every successful business owner I know has a circle of influencers around them that give them advice. And advice is just that advice from the perspective that they offer. And then, of course, the families need to make their own decision because it is their life and business. But the circle of leaders is really just a collaborative way to have a tax person and a legal person, a finance person be around you to all tackle the same topics and actually talk to each other. My family 25 years ago had all those people helping them, but none of them ever talked to each other to help come up with a strategy. So you win a big sum of money or you come into selling something that's going to be high, a lot of gains in it, you need those circle of leaders to make sure that your business is structured properly and you won't lose what you got. And ideally, in my opinion, you want to hire people that are smarter than you. Don't try to be the smartest person in the room. You know, uh, understand that you can't compete with somebody that does something, you know, that dedicates their life to something. Right, I can't compete, even though I might study the stock market or the, the markets. I can't compete with Todd because that's what he does. You know, you know, he's part time. I think he's only like 12 hours a day or something like that. Right. But there's people that are that are doing this so many hours a day. How do you think you're going to compete with them when they're they're doing it so much more? They're getting and they're they've got a circle of people that are filling their heads with all kinds of guidance and advice. That's why I'm able to go to Todd on a day like today and, you know, throw, a, throw a subject at him that it's not really, I mean, we didn't plan on this kind of a topic. I didn't know that there was going to be a $2 billion lottery tomorrow. Right. So I just throw this at him. And because of experience, he can pull these things out because you have people around you that are smarter than you. Continue our conversation. Todd Halterman is with us. He is the financial guru and uh, talking the last segment, we're not going to go over it again, but in the last segment we talked about, you know, what do you do if you come into a large sum of money, lottery, inheritance, um, you know, you invent something? We're not going to go over that again. But part of one of the key things you said there, Todd, and it's a it's a big issue is defense wins championships. So right. the defense can even be if you're not dealing with, you know, in, uh, receiving a large sum of money, you know, defending what you have and trying to minimize that interest expense. Talk about that a little bit. Well, when you say, uh, say that again, Ron, I'm sorry, minimize the interest expense. Minimizing your interest expense. If you can get rid of those uh, expenses you know, that are, are going to get you nothing, right? Interest doesn't, doesn't get you, uh, you, don't, you don't get any value from interest. You might enjoy that product that you bought, but interest is simply an expense. It's not... You, you didn't buy the interest. You bought the car. You bought the house. You bought the refrigerator. You bought the fancy watch that you had to have but couldn't wait till you saved up for it. You didn't really – no, I don't – you know, I, I lead a lending company, and I don't know too many people that go out and say, you know something, I think I want a mortgage today. Sure. Right? Sure. They go out and they say, I want to buy a new house. I want to buy a whatever. 
It's not, right. not you know, I'm looking forward to that mortgage. Yeah. Talk and about that part of it. Well, that's, that's what we call in our world, the cost of capital. And it really is the cost of capital means how best can I use my money and tie up that capital to advance my life? And is it better put into a car, a depreciating asset, or is it better to put it into maybe a piece of real estate, which is an appreciating asset um, by and large? So it really is about your credit and the interest expense. And is it deductible or not? And how can I apply the use of the money that I'm borrowing in the best way in my business life or in my personal life? And um, obviously lower interest is better, but how you're using that interest in your life really applies to the cost of capital. Yeah, there, and, that, and, there's, and, and there's good, good uh, debt and bad debt. Yes. Right? And we're constantly talking about the idea of how to convert that bad debt into good debt. And we're not going to give you um, tax advice. We're not CPAs. In fact, we're not even giving you financial advice. That you have to, if you want that from Todd, you have to call him and he'll do all the due diligence then behind the scenes that, that he's got to do for legal reasons. We're just trying to give you that 30,000 foot uh, thought process here. So what are some of the things that you're doing to help people get rid of their, the, the bad debts that they've got on their books? Well, a lot of people are coming in and saying, geez, the market's been falling. Uh, it looks like we're going to be in a recessionary climate, um, worried about um, what do they do to prepare for this. And the bottom line is debt is what kills a lot of families from retiring when they want to or retiring comfortably. So we start with debt elimination, Ron, and looking at good debt, bad debt, and how they're managing that debt service. But one of the things I love that you and your team do is you look effectively at how much they're putting out on the debt that they own and what is the debt cost, that interest expense, and how are they managing that? And is there a more efficient, effective way to manage debt so they have more cash flow every month for the capital that they need to live or to be able to retire down the road. So um, your programs, uh, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on the air, but I have personally watched how your programs change people's wealth and their monthly cash flow by reapportioning their debts to something that's more efficient and effective cost of capital so they can get where they need to be financially. So I have a lot of folks that, I, that we talk to that come in and they say, I, I'm, I'm, putting, I'm maximizing the money I put into my 401k. And, you know, we, we, we've talked, I, I forgot, we, we just had somebody that Josh might remember, we had somebody just recently on the air that we were talking to about the idea that, you know, they're, they're living for that retirement, which may be 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road, but they're not living today and tomorrow and next year. Does some of what you're saying have, you know, are you looking at that 401k and saying, are we, are we putting too much money there while we waste money on, uh, on bad debt ex expenses? Sure. Do you see that happening? Oh, it, all day long. I mean, people, honestly, because the accountant doesn't talk to the financial advisor or banker, vice versa, uh, people um, are putting money where they think it's best and it feels right. Um, you know, in our operation, we try to help people look at it from a scientific standpoint. In our debt elimination programs, get people out of debt in nine years or less without spending any more than they spend every month right now. And Ron, you're right. People direct monies to where they think it's best, but they don't do it in the right efficient manner because they're not an actuary or they're not a doctor of science and math. In our operation, we look to see where they're putting their money out at and are they over contributing to 401ks? Are they not putting the extra money in the right spots on certain debts? Um, are they managing the debt properly or could they consolidate? So when they're talking about debts, it's more about where are they putting their cash? How are they applying it? What's the interest cost? And then how do we get you out of debt without you feeling broke every month for 20 years until you're actually out of debt? So our office really tries to help people come up with a debt elimination plan with, without spending any more than they spend right now. We simply help people move on paper where they're putting their capital on a monthly basis so they can be debt-free. 
Now, here's the, you know, when, when I, as think, thinking from my position as a consumer advocate, I love listening to you because I know that financial planners make money by having more assets under management. And you're coming about this from saying, hey, you know something, we've got time for that. Let's do it in the right order and get rid of the debts, which does not really generate money for your practice. No, it doesn't. We're a, our office is a smart vester um, certified office. We are a, an advocate for organizations like Dave Ramsey and being a, a financial steward with your proceeds. But it really starts with having a plan on how to make today work for you so you're stable and safe in your current life. Then if we can reduce or eliminate debt without you increasing your spending on a monthly basis, that's going to do nothing but perpetuate your financial wealth later uh, and help you hit those retirement goals. But if we don't stop the leaks, it's really going to be hard to get the boat to stay afloat. So when we come back, Todd, I want to talk to you about, can I catch up with my retirement savings if I drop my 401k contributions or, or, or reduce my 401k contributions now, I want to talk to you about that when we come back. Continuing our conversation with Todd Halterman this morning. Thank you for our, our Navy service. So we've got a, a, a Navy seaman on, on with us today. And we, have, we certainly appreciate it in this week of, of, of uh, Veterans Day. We appreciate your service and appreciate uh, all that you do for the military men and women. Because I know for you, it, it's never stopped. I watch what you do all the time. And the fact that you're not a, a active service member doesn't mean that you're not uh, really still servicing and serving the, the military community. And, and there's a lot of people that probably don't say thank you, but, you know, I'm one that will. So thank you for all that you do and all the education you brought me that, that I can go out and, and uh, try and follow in your footsteps. Maybe that's, uh, you know, get, get your, your uh, oversized mini me. <laughs> it's about welcoming them home and, and helping them understand that there's there is help, there's resources, and people do care uh, and want to be present. Well, part of the problem, Todd, and you've shared with me your your uh, methodology is the men and women of the military are unbelievably proud people, and so many of them just uh, it's it's not in their DNA to ask for help. How it's do you not. go about changing that paradigm? Well, in the military, we're trained to help a person stand into our left and to our right. Uh, we're taught for selfless service, and we're not there for ourselves. We're there for our team. We're there for our unit. Uh, we're there for our objective. And um, our, our objective is to sacrifice our now for the good of our country. And so when you come home uh, complaining or asking for help, uh, can be seen as a sign of weakness, and, and it is a problem psychologically, and people need to understand why. So part of that you've you've educated me is if if you uh, I, I learned I had to learn this for my family in the world of dementia. So you know when I was uh, when my dad was going through dementia, I had a a mentor say to me. Hey, you know something? Agree and divert. And that's that's kind of how you deal with somebody with dementia because you're not going to change the, that what's built in. With the military, you've shared with me, it's, you're not going to be able to get somebody to ask for help, but if you can ask them to help somebody else, who might you know that need these services that you can bring to this event with us to get the services they need? You need to bring them with you. And that kind of changes where it goes exactly what you said. It's that that man or woman on the left or right, as opposed to them going themselves. And by osmosis, they get some of the uh, information they need. Yeah, I mean, they're, they, they, what they feel is real. Uh, perception is reality. What they're going through is real to them. And what they need is real. So how about turning that around and saying, I know you're feeling this way. I know you're experiencing these things. And I know what that looks like. But how can you and I go out and help somebody that feels just like you do and give them the tools they may need to get moving forward with their life? And if they can take their eyes off themselves, oftentimes solutions present themselves to help others, and then they can actually follow their own advice. 
great guidance right there. Great guidance from you, and I appreciate you educating me on that. I want to get back to a question we talked about in the last segment also, Todd. So one of the things that I hear so often is, I'm going to maximize my 401k so I can retire. And we talked about in the last segment that you know, maybe you're not able to live today because you're maximizing that retirement. And, and I know well, in Southern California, we don't get rain, but it is raining today. Um, you know, there's going to be car accidents and there may be people that don't get to retirement after, you know, right. when there's accidents and nobody plans that. But my right. question is, if I reduce my 401k or my retirement contributions today, to do some of the things that you've talked about, you know, getting rid of the bad debts and getting rid of the interest expenses. Can I ever catch up on those on those uh, retirement numbers? Yeah. And every time I've done this analysis for families, Ron, it says two things. If you have extraordinary debt, it will keep you from an extraordinary retirement and it will keep you from being able to have a free life in that retirement and being done when you want to. So Contributing to your retirement plan is very important for A, to save for the future. B, it also helps reduce tax liabilities. But at the same time, where is your best cost of capital? If you're paying you know, an, a loan uh, at 6%, and right now the current effective interest rate isn't 6% unless you hold the loan for the entire term of the loan. We all know the first three to five years of a loan is predominantly interest because banks charge interest up front. So many people are saving money in their 401k to make that 6 to 8% over time, but not allocating that money to getting rid of a debt is costing them 14 to 20% of their payments over time right now. So it's not about where are you putting it? It's about why are you putting it there and where is the best use of it? But let's just pretend we wipe out credit cards over a two and a half year period of time by redirecting some of the cash that goes into the retirement plan to get rid of that short-term unsecured debt. Well, once you get rid of that unsecured short-term debt, which is eating you alive at $1,500 a month, then that becomes $18,000 that we can direct absolutely 100% to your own bucket to save it for the future. And that's that much more that we can save, whether it's pre-tax or a tax-free or post-tax. But this unsecured debt is killing Americans and they're putting too much in their retirement and they've got too much debt. There is a balance to be had. Yeah, it's amazing when you start looking at how those actuary tables and the amortization tables work. It's pretty crazy. And most people have no idea of two different numbers. And I'm going to share with you right now two numbers that 99% of the people don't know. Number one, what is your blended household interest rate? Right. I hear people, Ron, you got me a 3% interest on my mortgage, you know, a couple of years ago, but yeah, you're right. But you know, your, your blended rate is 7%. That's what we need to work off of. So what is your household blended interest rate? If you don't know it, give us a call. We'll figure that out for you. And what is your effective percentage rate? We talk all the time about APR. I'm going to tell you that EPR is probably just as important as knowing the APR the effective percentage rate. If you want more information on that, give us a call on that one, 800-306-1990. Todd, once again, I thank you for your service in our military, for our country, and, and for all the good stuff you do and the education you bring to Ron Siegel Radio. I really appreciate your time and always being there for, for us and for our organization. Absolutely. And, and just let all the veterans know out there, Ron, that they need help, they need some guidance. Call your show. We're I appreciate to- it. Yeah, we, we're, we're here to help as we always do. 